You figure out to page 33. Heck, you know, we're almost, you know, we're right towards the end of this already. How did we get there so quickly? Well, it's hardly any pictures in the back, that's all. <laughs> Uh, page 33, what I'm going to do here is just put up, uh, I'll, I'll put them up as slides, but they're, they're in there as well. Have a read through these two partnerships. We've, we've given you a little more detail about two of them, and then the last two um, slides are a couple of questions. Get together in groups for 15 minutes and have a discussion around these, okay? Just to, uh, we need your help, really. No. <laughs> just, uh, have a discussion about it, and then we'll come back and, and feedback, and then we'll have lunch. Okay, first one is uh, T. Raju. You've already heard about him. The photo there is uh, him and his wife, Debbie, in the green, and then his daughter, Hepzibah. Um, if you read the Old Testament, you'll know where that comes from. Um, who's training to be a nurse and wants to come back and work in the project. So here's uh, the, the bio, if you like, of, of T. Raju and the the partnership that he's involved with, New Ark Mission of India, caring for the destitute people from the streets of Bangalore, which is a city of about mm, 8, 10 million people, to Mercy Ministry, bulk of the beneficiaries have no capacity, most of them if you go there are quite disturbed mentally and, uh, and need a lot of uh, support and help. He now has three locations, with men, women and children, more than 5,000 people have been brought in. Many of them are dead on arrival. We've been there at times when ambulances turned up and they've just carried a dead body on a stretcher. Uh, they got there too late. There are now about 500 live ones from the 5,000 that were rescued. He wants to have 1,000 people living with him. Think about this in the context of sustainability. He wants to start more centres in Mumbai and other small places. <laughs> uh, 20 million people in Mumbai. Uh, every year the costs increase for capital expenditure and for operation. At the moment they're making about 1,200 meals a day. They've never missed a meal. He's burned off many employees and potential leaders by his intensity. <laughs> I remember going there one day and he'd just done an operation on a woman with cancer. Like he put his hand inside her, through her neck and just pulled the thing out. And wondered why uh, the nurse wouldn't do that uh, without gloves on. Um, he's just turned 40. Um, his family is fully involved. In fact, they live there amongst the people. His daughter is training to a nurse and wants to become involved. Their personal support comes from the money received from donors, so well, the money just goes into a pot and they just live from that along with the people. Bright Hope World is the only regular external donor, and this, uh, you know, because the numbers are increasing, the amounts need to increase. And he gets more support from the Hindu community than he does from the churches. There are four churches in Bangalore that help him. They're all Korean churches. Not one Indian church. Uh, now, that's one. Now we're going to Naranjan and Sonu. Oh, those little numbers up there, like NEPO2 and INDO, whatever, which isn't there, well, it's in some of the earlier ones. That's the code in, if you go in, into the Bright World website. Naranjan has started the Ray of Hope Society, has a vision for church planting, uh, and he does that by training leaders. From day one, he rejected the model of external financial support for pastors. He refused it. I mean, that was his reason for going back there was to break that model. He built a clinic and a model farm in a rural community. I told you about the co-op earlier. Established a resource centre, revolving fund, and a women's empowerment program. Well, a number of them. Which have been funded as a, uh, which have funded the start of a startup of many um, small businesses. So, so hundreds of people are now part of their their microloan program. He's training thousands of church leaders, uh, thousands of church leaders through a network. He's actually got the got a whole uh, training system there. It's very impressive. He trains trainers who then go out and train. 
130 plus churches in his network, which is called the Flock of God. We helped him set up an egg production unit uh, with 2,000 layers, gave him a 25,000k loan, and he repaid the whole thing within two years. The money was all in the bank when the earthquake came. Um, so, uh, yeah, he came to us with a plan, as Fraser said last night. He didn't just jump in there and help people handing out food. There were lots of people doing that. He got engaged with a number of communities that he had friends and partners in, and, and they've gone for the medium longer term. And you know, it's, it's um, based around building a, a, a temporary shelter that people could live in, so the whole village could come and live in the one building, and then loans to help them go out and start you know, generating their own incomes again, because the land was still there, even though the houses were, were knocked down. He's in his early 40s. His family is fully involved. There's two children. They adopted a girl that they rescued from a brothel when she was just a 10 year old. He needs no uh, personal support. He's established his own businesses. No ongoing support is required. So there's the two, the two scenarios. And now there's a few questions. <coughs> Get together in groups of four or five or something like that and, and have, have a look at those. Compare the two. What do you notice about the two? Come back to us at the end and tell us, are they? Or are they not sustainable? And why? <laughs>